But our patron, warned by this disaster, resolved to take more care of himself for the future, and having lying by him the longboat of our English ship that he had taken, he resolved he would not go a-fishing any more without a compass and some provision, so he ordered the carpenter of his ship, who was also an English slave, to build a little state-room or cabin in the middle of the longboat, like that of a barge, with a place to stand behind it to steer, and haul home the main-sheet, the room before for a hand or two to stand and work the sails. She sailed with what we call a shoulder-of-mutton sail, and the boom jibed over the top of the cabin, which lay very snug and low, and had in it room for him to lie, with a slave or two, and a table to eat on, with some small lockers to put in some bottles of such liquor as he thought fit to drink, and his bread, rice, and coffee. We went frequently out with this boat a-fishing, and as I was most dexterous to catch fish for him, he never went without me. It happened that he had appointed to go out in this boat, either for pleasure or for fish, with two or three moors of some distinction in that place, and for whom he had provided extraordinarily, and had, therefore, sent on board the boat overnight a larger store of provisions than ordinary, and had ordered me to get ready three fusees with powder and shot, which were on board his ship, so that they designed some sport of fowling as well as fishing. I got all things ready as he had directed, and waited the next morning with the boat washed clean, her ancient and pendants out, and everything to accommodate his guests, when by and by my patron came on board alone, and told me his guests had put off going from some business that fell out, and ordered me, with the man and boy, as usual, to go out with the boat and catch them some fish, so that his friends were to sup at his house, and commanded that as soon as I got some fish I should bring it home to his house, all of which I prepared to do. This moment my former notions of deliverance darted into my thoughts, for now I found I was likely to have a little ship at my command, and my master being gone, I prepared to furnish myself, not for fishing business, but for a voyage, though I knew not, neither did I so much as consider, whither I should steer. Anywhere to get out of that place was my desire. My first contrivance was to make a pretense to speak to this moor, to get something for our subsistence on board, for I told him we must not presume to eat of our patron's bread. He said that was true, so he brought a large basket of rusk or biscuit, and three jars of fresh water into the boat. I knew where my patron's case of bottles stood, which it was evident, by the make, were taken out of some English prize, and I conveyed them into the boat while the moor was on shore, as if they had been there before, for our master. I conveyed also a great lump of beeswax into the boat, which weighed about half a hundred weight, with a parcel of twine or thread, a hatchet, a saw, and a hammer, all of which were of great use to us afterwards, especially the wax, to make candles. Another trick I tried upon him, which he innocently came into also. His name was Ismail, which they call Muley, or Moley, so I called to him, Moley, said I, our patron's guns are on board the boat. Can you not get a little powder and shot? It may be we may kill some alchemies, a fowl like our curlews, for ourselves, for I know he keeps the gunner's stores in the ship. Yes, says he, I'll bring some. And accordingly he brought a great leather pouch, which held a pound and a half of powder, or rather more, and another with shot, that had five or six pounds, with some bullets, and put all into the boat. At the same time I had found some powder of my master's in the great cabin, with which I filled one of the large bottles in the case, which was almost empty, pouring what was in it into another, and thus furnished with everything needful, we sailed out of the port to fish. The castle, which is at the entrance of the port, knew who we were, and took no notice of us, and we were not above a mile out of port before we hauled in our sail and set us down to fish. The wind blew from the north-northeast, which was contrary to my desire, for had it blown southerly I had been sure to have made the coast of Spain, and at least reached to the Bay of Cadiz, but my resolutions were, blow which way it would, I would be gone from that horrid place where I was, and leave the rest to fate. After we had fished some time and caught nothing, for when I had fish on my hook I would not pull them up, that he might not see them, 
I said to the moor, This will not do. Our master will not be thus served. We must stand farther off. He, thinking no harm, agreed, and being in the head of the boat, set the sails. And, as I had the helm, I ran the boat out near a league farther, and then brought her to, as if I would fish, when, giving the boy the helm, I stepped forward to where the moor was, and making as if I stooped for something behind him, I took him by surprise with my arm under his waist, and tossed him clear overboard into the sea. He rose immediately, for he swam like a cork, and called to me, begged to be taken in, told me he would go all over the world with me. He swam so strong after the boat that he would have reached me very quickly, there being but little wind, upon which I stepped into the cabin, and, fetching one of the fowling pieces, I presented it at him, and told him I had done him no hurt, and if he would be quiet, I would do him none. But, said I, you swim well enough to reach to the shore, and the sea is calm. Make the best of your way to shore, and I will do you no harm. But if you come near the boat, I'll shoot you through the head, for I am resolved to have my liberty. So he turned himself about, and swam for the shore, and I make no doubt but he reached it with ease, for he was an excellent swimmer. I could have been content to have taken this moor with me, and have drowned the boy, but there was no venturing to trust him. When he was gone I turned to the boy, whom they called Zuri, and said to him, Zuri, if you will be faithful to me, I'll make you a great man, but if you will not stroke your face to be true to me, that is, swear by Mohammed and his father's beard, I must throw you into the sea, too. The boy smiled in my face, and spoke so innocently that I could not distrust him, and swore to be faithful to me, and go all over the world with me. While I was in view of the moor that was swimming, I stood out directly to sea with a boat, rather stretching to windward, that they might think me gone toward the strait's mouth, as indeed any one that had been in their wits must have been supposed to do. For who would have supposed we were sailed on to the southward, to the truly barbarian coast, where whole nations of negroes were sure to surround us with their canoes and destroy us, where we could not go on shore but we should be devoured by savage beasts, or more merciless savages of humankind. But as soon as it grew dusk in the evening, I changed my course, and steered directly south and by east, bending my course a little towards the east, that I might keep in with the shore, and having a fair fresh gale of wind, and a smooth quiet sea, I made such sail that I believe by the next day, at three o'clock in the afternoon, when I first made the land, I could not be less than one hundred and fifty miles south of Sali quite beyond the emperor of Morocco's dominions, or indeed of any other king thereabouts, for we saw no people. Yet such was the fright I had taken of the Moors, and the dreadful apprehensions I had of falling into their hands, that I would not stop, or go on shore, or come to an anchor, the wind continuing fair till I had sailed in that manner five days, and then the wind shifting to the southward, I concluded also that if any of our vessels were in chase of me, they also would now give over. So I ventured to make to the coast, and came to an anchor in the mouth of a little river, I knew not what, nor where, neither what latitude, what country, what nation, or what river. I neither saw nor desired to see any people. The principal thing I wanted was fresh water. We came into this creek in the evening, resolving to swim on shore as soon as it was dark, and discover the country. But as soon as it was quite dark, we heard such dreadful noises of the barking, roaring, and howling of wild creatures, of we knew not what kinds, that the poor boy was ready to die with fear, and begged of me not to go on shore till day. "'Well, Zuri,' said I, "'then I won't. But it may be that we may see men by day, who will be as bad to us as those lions.' "'Then we give them the shoot-gun,' says Zuri, laughing. "'Make them run way.' Such English Zuri spoke by conversing among us slaves. However, I was glad to see the boy so cheerful, and I gave him a dram, out of our patron's case of bottles, to cheer him up. After all, Zuri's advice was good, and I took it. We dropped our little anchor, and lay still all night. I say still, for we slept none, for in two or three hours we saw vast great creatures, we knew not what to call them, of many sorts, come down to the seashore and run into the water, 
wallowing and washing themselves for the pleasure of cooling themselves, and they made such hideous howlings and yellings that I never indeed heard the like. 